And uh, let me just say, I know Pete mentioned it earlier, uh, but I am excited about the Lake Baptisms event. 28 people join us to proclaim their faith in Jesus. And it's not too late uh, for you to jump in either to get baptized or just to come hang out and, uh, and celebrate with those that are, are being baptized. And we wanna welcome our online audience and our Parker campus here today as well. We're glad to have you guys joining us. You know, uh, I also hope that you guys did your homework. Last week, Pastor Chad assigned some homework. I know you're like, hey, I graduated from school. I don't have to do that anymore. I don't wanna do homework anymore. But, but Pastor Chad assigned some homework for you guys to discuss some things Things, one of which being our marriage vow renewal next weekend. And uh, I wanna talk about that a little bit because we've gotten some questions on kind of the specifics of that. And the biggest question is, do I have to dress up? Do I, is it fancy? Do I have to dress up? What do I wear? And I will say you can make it as fancy as you want or rather as fancy as your spouse wants it to be in that moment. You can go, you can go fancy like Pastor Joe with a tuxedo or have a few formal like Pastor Chad with his tuxedo t-shirt. Uh, anywhere in between is fine for us. The other question we've gotten is like, do, are we coming on stage? Do we have to like stand up here and in front of everyone? And so what our plan is is We'll have some extra room down here across the front and we're gonna invite people to come forward uh, and just as a large group here. Uh, and even if you don't wanna do that, you can just stand where you're at in the room and participate that way. We're also excited because we're gonna have some desserts and some other treats as kind of a, a celebration uh, to culminate uh, our series and our study with that. But um, you know, as we continue every week, we've been kind of obviously talking about marriage and our, our teaching team has been talking about their relationships and their past. And so I obviously have to follow suit in that and share uh, kind of my marriage story and uh, in the background there. But I would be remiss uh, if I didn't back up a little. And I don't have photos with bell-bottom jeans and stuff to show you because I'm a child to some of you. Um, but I do have a, a great story of the, the before marriage side of things because my wife and I didn't exactly get off on the right foot. See, I started attending Calvary as a young teenager, was just kind of an attendee in the background, and then got mildly connected later on, serving on our tech team and stuff. But um, I knew of, of my wife, Amber, because as some of you figured out last week with me being in Pastor Chad's family photos, uh, I married Chad's oldest daughter, Amber. And so I knew of her and was fond of her from the little bit that I knew her, but I did not know her personally. And um, as I was kind of working through some things, I had an occasion where I needed to meet with Pastor Chad. But the reason for that was I was in Boy Scouts and I was working on this kind of project and I needed to interview my pastor. Um, and I'm, I'm, you're starting to kind of put a picture together. I think I'm up there, yeah. So that's me getting my, my Eagle Scout award with my Scoutmaster and the, the mayor of Havasu at the time. And um, so I'm, I was a Boy Scout, an Eagle Scout. I was also homeschooled and a little nerdy, not exactly like a great social resume for a teenager. Um, and so I, 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 I was very fond of Amber, but I knew my chances were very slim. So I just kind of was like, okay, that it is what it is. And um, one day I'm meeting with Pastor Chad, this is over at our McCulloch campus in his office, and I'm sitting there in my scout uniform, like the photo, with my mom, because I couldn't drive, and out of the corner of my eye, I see Amber walk by, and I'm just like, oh boy. And, and just really hoping like she doesn't come in the office, she doesn't say anything, and just kind of continues, but Chad didn't let that happen. Um, and my blood pressure spiked when I heard Chad say, hey, Amber, come on in here. There's someone I want to introduce you to. Because Chad being Chad knew I wasn't really well connected. And he's like, hey, I'm going to introduce him and help him maybe get involved in the youth group and get more connected to the church because he just can't help but do that. And it's a great thing unless you're the, the teenage boy in his office going, no, like not, not right now, not in the Boy Scout uniform with my mom. <laughs> in the pastor's office, like, can we meet anywhere else under any different circumstances? But that's not how it played out. She came in, we chit-chatted, she left, and I'm like, well, if I had a chance, it's gone now. Like, there's just, it, okay, like, I, I, guess, I guess it's just never gonna happen. And thankfully, the Lord has grace. A couple years later, our two best friends were dating, and so we got to spend some time together. We became friends, also serving at church together, and, um, 
After a couple months of being friends, we started dating, and uh, about a year after that, I proposed. While I was a senior in high school and, and had just turned 18, those of you that are parents of teenagers, you can be welcome that I don't share that part of our story with our high school students here at the church much. Um, and uh, about a year and a half later, we got married and while we were still in college, even when everyone told us not to do that. And then, uh, you know, here we are, 11 years of marriage later, we got two kids, and uh, we're able to be back here in Havasu serving at Calvary. So that's, that's our story. That's our story. And, and I share that because this whole series kind of came about from our teaching team saying, hey, let's kind of help people rewind back to that moment they said I do. That moment that we gathered our friends and family, we stood before God and these witnesses, and we said that, that, that we are committing to love and to cherish for better or worse in sickness and in health, forsaking all others until death do us part. I do. That moment that we said, hey, we're going to commit to love and, and, and provide for and cherish and spend our life with one person. And, and really, that's at the heart of, of today's message, that idea that, that marriage is really centered around the idea of exclusivity. That, that, you know, in some of your marriage vows, some of those old-fashioned vows, you, there's that line, forsaking all others. Because at the heart of marriage is this idea that, that everyone else goes to the, to the sides. That there's no one else on our radar, there's no one else that, that matters at the level that our spouse matters to us. And so today, what I want to do is kind of unpack what does that mean for us today? Um, you know, obviously, we can kind of understand what it means in the moment of saying I do, but, you know, if we're 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years later in marriage, what's that mean for us? And so as we do that, we're going to look at uh, Matthew chapter 19. I'm going to encourage you guys to, to flip over there. Matthew chapter 19, uh, we're going to start in verse 4, and uh, Jesus is going to share um, a, a brief statement about marriage, and we're going to use that as kind of our launching point for today. He says this, he answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female and said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. What therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. I apologize. I hear some of you still flipping there and I'm done. So sorry for that. But a short passage, but Jesus kind of gives a really good overview of some of the aspects of marriage and really on this idea of forsaking all others that we're going to dive into tonight or as we do this. So the first thing that, that he really lays out for us that we need to get is that God created us to leave and cleave. Now, those words did not necessarily appear in the passage here, and some of you are like, what in the world is cleaving? Um, and so this, this comes from the King James Version, the old English version of the Bible. And, and in that version, it said, you know, that God created them to leave and to cleave, that, that we leave behind some aspects of life and that we cleave or hold fast to, join together with, kind of combine lives with our spouse. And so that, that leave and cleave has kind of become a, a statement in Christian vocabulary for, for many, many years now. But God's designed us to, to leave some things, but then also to join with our spouse. And so what's that look like? Because the leaving part, I think, is, is a lot more important than we initially see it. Because at the very surface, we see that, that God is saying, hey, you were designed to leave your family of origin. That, that you're no longer in that unit as kind of a primary kind of membership status. Now, that doesn't mean when you say I do, you like disown your family and never talk to them again and you go somewhere else for Christmas and all that. I mean, you might if your family's super dysfunctional and toxic, but under normal circumstances, like that doesn't end just because you say I do. But, but there is an element that where we, when we join together, we have to realize that, that our spouse is now the priority that living for our parents' approval or satisfaction or living with their priorities as our priority is in competition to our marriage. And what we don't want to build is a dynamic where our spouse feels like they're competing against our family for attention or for priorities or for directives. So, so we have to, to find that balance. Of, of loving our family because the, the command to love and honor our parents doesn't end when we say I do. But we also have to realize that God, in his design for marriage, says, hey, 
your spouse now needs to become the number one human relationship priority that you have. So first, that idea of leaving is us leaving our family of origin as our, you know, order of priorities and, and kind of our, our relational membership, leaving that to join with our spouse, but also it means leaving our single life behind. And I think this is probably more of a, a, an issue than we might realize. Because obviously it means leaving like our past romantic relationships. Obviously we can't be dating other people and married. Kind of goes against the nature of marriage. But also it means that, that we have to leave behind our interest in those past individuals. See, so often we hear stories of, of, of spouses kind of keeping tabs on their exes on social media and things like that. And it seems like, oh, well, that's just a few people. But a study I read when I was looking into this uh, cited that almost a third of divorce filings in recent years cited Facebook or social media as a reason for that. Now, it didn't get into, are they just, you know, so obsessed with social media and it's kind of, you know, destroying their life or are they diving into, you know, past relationships or didn't give information, but but it doesn't take long to put the pieces together of, of kind of, hey, what's going on with this person? And I'm going to keep tabs on them. So le- leaving our single life behind with our relationships, but also leaving our single life behind in terms of how we live. Because if you think back, for some of you, it's recent. For some of you, it's, it's been a little longer. But when you're single, you worry about you and what you want to do when you want to do it and how you want to spend your time and your money. And it's all about you. And you're like, hey, I need to have a meeting to discuss like how I'm going to do this. Oh, I just meet with myself and everything's great. (laughs) But then you get married and it can't be that way. So all those discussions about time and money and entertainment and planning and events and how we, we spend our time and how we clean or organize the house or don't and all those things now are a joint conversation. And, and, and that's incredibly important because there's a ton of people who are like, yeah, we're married, we love each other and stuff, but they've got all this tension because they're still living like two single people under the same household. And they're making all their decisions and all their priorities based on what they want instead of what is best for them as a spouse and what's best for their marriage and then in their relationship there. So as you, as you look at God's design, the, th- the thing we have to see first is that, that he's calling us when we make a commitment to get married to leave some things behind. And, and let me just encourage you to think through like, are there things that I haven't fully left behind that I need to to fully commit and, and, and join to my spouse. And that might be some family stuff, that might be some old kind of single lifestyle and life habit things, or it might be some other things. But let me encourage you to think about that because God has designed us to, to leave. But then that other side of it shows us that, God, that we were created for oneness with our spouse. So we, we leave, but then it, we, we join together, we cleave, we hold fast to our spouse. And he continues and he says, Um, So they are no longer two, but one flesh, is what Christ says there about marriage. See, we we get this, right? We get this because when we listen to the marriage ceremony, there's all this talk about one flesh, and you're joined together, and and you're coming together. But, But in that, we have to remember that there's now changes in how we refer to things. There's pronoun changes about, it's not yours and mine, it's ours, it becomes our possessions, our decisions, our directives, our needs, our ideas. And, and that, we have to remember that because we aren't individual people living under one household, but God says, hey, you're supposed to join together and become one. And as we do this, we have to, to realize that, that unity and oneness is not something that we naturally excel at as human beings. I don't know if you've noticed this, but we are kind of selfish as a, a personality trait and as a sin tendency. And so I want to kind of dive into a passage. Ephesians 4 talks about how do we pursue unity. And, and unity and oneness are, are kind of one and the same. But Ephesians 4, Paul's writing, he says this. He says, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you've received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. Now, he's not talking specifically about a marriage relationship here. 
But as we've kind of said through this whole series, a lot of the stuff we talk about can be applied to any human relationship that we have. We're just specifically applying it to our marriages in these four weeks. But he's, he's saying, hey, here's some things to keep in mind if you want unity, if you want oneness, if you want closeness in your relationship for us in our marriage relationship, here's some things he's saying we have to do. First, we have to live with humility. You live with humility. I want you to think for a second on, on someone that you know that's truly humble, that you're like, man, they just are incredibly humble as a personality trait. And as you think about that person, you probably think about the fact that there's, there's a draw to them, that you naturally want to be around them. There's like this magnetic pull because people that are truly humble are, are fun to be around and are enjoyable to be in relationship with because that's how God has created us. And so when we look at, hey, how do, we, how do we build a marriage that's close, where there's oneness, where there's connection, living with humility is, is at the core of this. And, and humility is obviously, you know, avoiding pride and arrogance and, and, and living that way, but, but it's also putting our needs secondary to someone else. Uh, you know, it reminds me of that great C.S. Lewis quote that says, humility is not thinking less of ourself, but thinking of ourself less. So saying, hey, I'm, I'm gonna think about my needs and priorities less than I'm gonna think about my spouse. I'm gonna think about what do they need? What, how can I help them? How can I serve them? How can I make their day better? How can I take this off their plate to alleviate stress? Whatever it looks like for you, live with humility. It's going to build a healthier marriage. So th- like I said, think about and prioritize your spouse's needs. Second idea in that is be willing to admit that you're wrong and your spouse is right. I'll repeat that for some of you that maybe didn't want to hear it the first time. Be willing to admit you're wrong and that your spouse is right. How, how, how long do we hold on to things where we're like, I know I'm wrong and they're right, but I don't want to say it out loud. Humility is being willing to say, I was wrong and you were right and it's gonna build a better relationship for me taking that moment of, of hit to our pride. So, so live with humility. Second thing that, that we're encouraged to do here is to live with gentleness. See, it, it's not necessarily physical gentleness, although that's kind of an assumed reality, hopefully, but it's the gentleness of how we treat people, how we talk to them, how we interact with them. Because I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this, or maybe it's just me being a terrible person, I find it a lot easier to be rude and mean to people that I really love and am close with. Any of you with me there? Like, it's easier to, to, be, to be kind of short and harsh and rude to someone that you're really close with, a lot easier than it would be to be that way towards a friend or a coworker. And I think it's because we know them. Like, we really know them. We, we know all of their stuff, all their, you know, tendencies that are annoying and frustrating at times we also know what gets under their skin, which means we're good at throwing that back at them for leverage when we're not in a good place. But see, we're told to to live with humility and gentleness because we can bless or we can curse with how we interact with people, how we speak to our spouse, how we treat them. So that means that we can choose to be gentle and bless. We can ask questions instead of making accusations when things happen. We can respond with grace and patience when things come up that that maybe are difficult or challenging. We can can choose to speak to our spouse in a way that is honorable and, and, and wouldn't embarrass us if someone else listened in and heard our interactions. See, unity is built with with humility, it's built with gentleness, finally it's built with patience that one that you guys were hoping I would skip over because none of us actually like talking about patience, especially when we're like, I don't have time to be patient right now. You don't understand how, how frustrating this is. See, when, when we live with impatience, the result of that is angry words and bitter thoughts and malicious actions. And so if you are in a place with, with impatience in your marriage, that might be the place today that you need to start the most. Because patience is, is how we demonstrate grace and love to our spouse when things aren't going well, either externally or internally. 
And it's challenging because we spend all of our time with our spouse, which means we get to be annoyed by the same things over and over again. But but let me remind you of of just an encouragement in that. One, you made a commitment to, to marry them. So kind of that, like, that's on you. You chose this. But also, they put up with you. So there's, there's some give and take there that, that they're probably struggling with patience at some points, just like you are. So, so will you be patient with your spouse? Will you be patient when they drop the ball, when they, when they hurt or offend you unintentionally? Will you be patient with the work that God needs to do in their life and the progress that they're on? Will you be patient with how they proceed through processing life and events and the pace at which they do that? Will you even be patient with how long it takes them to get stuff done around the house or get ready to leave the house when those times come? See, if you want a great marriage, oneness, unity, connectedness needs to happen. We can lean into those things. We can lean into humility and gentleness and patience to build that. But finally, as we look at this passage, we see the reminder that that God's design is a lifelong marriage. See, Jesus reminds us here, he says, what therefore God has joined together, let not man separate. It's this reminder that that Jesus is re-communicating to us that God's design for marriage is one man and one woman for one lifetime. And, and, and that is, is laid out in this passage, and he's communicating that. And, and even in saying that, I want to recognize two things. First, that's an in, increasingly controversial statement and viewpoint in our world today. And, and it used to be that was the cultural norm. Now it's this kind of religious oddity, but it's what we're sticking to because it's God's design for us. But secondly, I just want to call out, that doesn't always happen. Like marriages don't always work. And depending on what study you read, most of them or a large, you know, a large portion of them don't work. And so I even kind of recognize that in the fact the passage that I chose to, to teach on today is in the context of Jesus talking about divorce and remarriage. That, that even in scripture, we see that God said, hey, I know that the ideal isn't gonna work, so that's gonna be the plan B. There isn't a plan C, but that can be a plan B. And, and so I put this here not to shame you if you are divorced or remarried and, and, and to pile on guilt. That's not at all the intention here. Nor is it the intention to say, hey, if you're in a, a bad relationship that's toxic or abusive, you gotta stay because God said it's for life. There's plenty of misguided religious legalistic people that have done that. I'm not gonna be one of them. But I am gonna put this here as a reminder to those of us that are married is a reminder that, that God's design is for this to be a lifelong thing for us. And that should naturally lead us to the question of, am I building and taking care of my marriage in a way that I want it to last a long time? And, and as I ponder this, I thought about a, a comparison. I thought about how we treat our, our daily driver car and how we treat rental cars. And in and, and, you know, you, you look at that and there's a very big difference in, in how the majority of people treat the two things. You know, you've got the jingle, it's a rental, don't be gentle. You know, no one makes jingles about beating up our daily drivers that we wanna like stay nice and for a long time. But how, the timeline that we view things on determines how we treat it. With a rental car, we've got it for a few days, maybe a week or two, so we don't really care about it. But our daily driver, or maybe even a collectible car, we say, hey, I I want this to last a really long time. So I'm gonna treat it nice, I'm gonna take care of it. And the same is true with our relationships. If we view them on a long timeline of saying, hey, I, I want this relationship to last 30, 40, 50 years, it forces us to ask the questions of, am I doing the things it takes to get a marriage that lasts 30, 40, 50 years? And we look around our world, unfortunately, that's not the viewpoint that's common. Because while our world maybe doesn't see marriages like rental cars, I think a lot of our world sees them as like car leases. They're like short term and you just, you know, you're in it as long as it's working for you and you enjoy it and everything's good. But the second it's not, you just dump it and go get a new one. Which makes God's design for marriage that much more important for us to contrast what isn't working in our world. 
So with that, how do we build a marriage that lasts a lifetime? How do we lean into that design saying, hey, God, you intend this to last forever. How do I do that? Well, in Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18, it says, let your fountains be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. And that's stated there in the context of a father pouring into his son, writing Proverbs saying, let me share wisdom with you. And more specifically, that context of Proverbs 5, 6, and 7 is that father sharing the dangers and kind of lure uh, and destructive abilities of adultery and infidelity. And he's saying, let me warn you about how strong this desire and temptation may be, but let me tell you how destructive it will be in your life. And in the, the midst of that, he starts by saying, let your fountains be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. We could contextualize that and say, if you want your life to be blessed, rejoice in the spouse of your youth. It's that idea of if we want a long-term marriage, we need to rejoice in our spouse. We do that first by not comparing them to other people. It's so easy to, to compare to our friends or our friends' spouses or the people we see on social media or simply what our, our idealized version of a spouse is. But rejoice in your spouse by thinking back to when you first fell in love. Think back with me, even right now, when, when you were young or younger in your relationship, Think about back then. You didn't compare them to anyone else because you didn't care about anyone else. There was no comparison. Even if you were tempted to, you'd be like, no, it doesn't matter because this is the one. And so we can rejoice in our spouse by going back to that mindset of saying, hey, it doesn't matter about anyone else. There is no comparison. There's no desire for comparison. You are the one. We can also rejoice in our spouse by rejoicing in all the seasons of their life. See, we've, we've done a lot of, of counseling uh, our pastoral team, and we've all heard those words when there's a marriage that's not going well, and one of the spouses say, they've changed. And there's always that negative connotation that they're not the person they used to be. And sometimes there's legitimate reasons, there's addiction, or there's disinterest, or infidelity, or something destructive, and that's the case. But the reality is, all of us change. I was married when I was 19. Thank the Lord that I'm a different person than I was when I was 19, or I would not be standing up here sharing with you guys, at least not for this long, before someone came and escorted me off the stage. Um, thank the Lord that we change, that God works in our life, that we grow and develop and, and evolve as people. And sometimes it's just our maturity. Sometimes it's even our personality takes a little different form as we go through different seasons of life. And so instead of being bitter that our spouse isn't the, you know, young, adventurous, crazy 20-something that they were when we met them, rejoice that, that they are who they are now. And, and rejoice in the fact that, that maybe they're a wise, mature, seasoned individual that has a very different view on life that you can share life with. Rejoice in, in every season of your spouse's life. Finally, rejoice in your spouse by making them the priority of your family. See, I'm, I'm mostly talking to our, our, our families with kids in the house right now. And that's, that's our season. We've got a, a three and a five-year-old, almost six-year-old. And life is crazy. And it doesn't get any easier as they become, you know, elementary age and teenagers and stuff like that. You've got youth group, you've got soccer practice, you've got dance, you've got tutoring, you've got all these different things. And the temptation for parents is to become very functional in the relationship and divvying up roles. You take them here, you do this, you cover that, I'll go here. And the temptation is for the, the priority to not be the emotional connection, but just the logistic connection. And that's why so many times we see individuals that they, the high school graduation comes, they're empty nesters, and there's nothing there relationally anymore. They look at their spouse, and they're like, I don't, I don't really know you they look at their spouse and they go, we used to have this common ground, this common purpose, but, but that's gone. So let me encourage you to, to lean in and make your spouse the priority of your family. I know that sounds kind of weird because we're always talking about kids here and I'm the family pastor. I'm supposed to be like all about kids and families, but hear this. Aside from modeling a healthy relationship with Jesus, the best thing you can model for your kids is a healthy marriage. 
And so take the date nights where you don't talk about schedules or kids. Take the, the, the getaways without the kids where you guys can have extended time to talk and to, to, to go on adventures or just make memories. Lean in and make your spouse the priority. See, there's, there's so many things that want to undermine our marriages. There's so many things that want to pull our attention away from our spouse to other things. And, and so I, I love the, the, the words of Jesus here, just to go back and say, hey, let's define marriage and remember the things that we need to focus on, of leaving some things behind, uh, of joining with our, our spouse in oneness and unity, and making them a priority by, by rejoicing in them for the rest of our life. See, my prayer for you guys, if you're in a, a committed married relationship, is that you would see it as a lifelong journey and that you would invest accordingly so that God would be glorified in your marriage. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for today. Thank you for the fact that you love us and, and so much that you have modeled sacrificial love and commitment through your son, Jesus. And so much so that you use Jesus' relationship to us as a model for what a husband and wife, how they should love and care for each other, how a husband should sacrifice for his wife. God, thank you for creating us for, for community, for relationship. Thank you for creating marriage for us to bless us, to, to enrich our life. And God, we pray that you would help us to invest accordingly. It's so easy to get pulled into other areas and, and have other distractions and other things undermining our marriage. So God, help us to prioritize our spouse so that we can follow the instructions you've given us and be blessed because of it. God, we, we want to, to be countercultural in how our marriage functions, what it looks like, and how long it lasts. So God, help us to do that. Give us grace when we fail and help restore some places that we've messed up along the way. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.